the climate, environment, and health responsiveness uh, course for the Americas. We remind you that there is simultaneous interpretation available by clicking on the corresponding channel. Choose interpretation, clicking on this button and choosing English or Spanish. Las, los participantes todavía se siguen conectando. The Menos. different participants are still joining the meeting, but we would like to only welcome today's session. We remind you that we are in week four. That means that we are already finishing with, we're over half the course already. We've actually concluded more than 50% of the course in this week, and that's why we congratulate you on your participation and your active participation, and especially by working on the concept note. Remember that the facilitators are available uh, for your questions, your concerns, and to support you during the drafting of your concept note. We also remind you that you should mute your microphones during the session, and we're going to check attendance when you are connected to the session. And you can click on the link um, to join the meeting that you received by email. We kindly ask you to turn on your cameras. It's not only important that we recognize each other, that we're able to see each other. It's important because we also record these sessions and it's we want to share this with the participants who were not able to be present for this session so that during the recording, they are able to see the different participants. We also remind you that there will be a Q&A session towards the end. And we ask you to be patient. We'll receive the questions by the chat box. And if we're not able to answer all questions, we're going to send them via email. And we'll send them to the different participants. As with all previous sessions, this is a 90 minute session. And we're going to start with a case study. And also remember that on the website, we have the reference materials, all the articles. Even today, we're going to upload an additional video relating to uh, transdisciplinary science. We're going to start with by presenting today's speakers. With the TD team, uh, Gabriela Alonso Llanes, she has been focusing on uh, learning and education in the context of sustainability and global change. In the last 10 years, she's participated in various research projects in collaboration with different objectives, including uh, increasing capacity of researchers and organizations with researchers and creating networks that includes members of the local community and the academics in the design and joint collaboration between uh, strategies to joint solutions. Uh, Gabriela's picture was not uploaded. Lily House Peters is a geographer and uh, an associate professor in climate justice, racism and in climate justice and governance and conservation policies and the role of emerging robotics. She has experience in TV research and she has conducted research in the Americas and Australia, uh, for instance, in the borders between the US, Mexico, Australia, and the uh, southern and eastern borders. Marshall Valentine is co-founder and vice, vice chair of the International Women's Coffee Alliance in Jamaica. After having been a technician in the lab for quality control in the uh, industry, coffee industry, she became a guarantor of quality in the coffee company and she's developed an important role in maintaining coffee quality in all the value chain in Jamaica. With her experience and knowledge, she has developed uh, auditing systems and information systems from different stakeholders in more than 25 organizations with the support of the Ministry of uh, Trade, uh, Agriculture and Fishing, and the organization being mentioned. 
y la mantilla es un epidemiologist for, with more than 30 years of experience in public health in the development of health systems. He has developed and implemented public, public health policies and programs for health promotion and disease control at national, local, and international levels. She has experience in applied research to produce a risk profile of climate change by countries and regions and the development of associations to check and uh, help uh, respondents. She has been a leader of a program to that links uh, climate, environment and health in Colombia. Martin Garcia Cartagena is a professor of the uh, University of Massey in New Zealand with 13 years in, of experience in research and uh, implementation and strategy. Uh, community resilience, conservation of biodiversity and transdisciplinary approaches for producing knowledge and policy design uh, programs in the context of global environmental change. Without any further ado, I would like now to Give the floor to Hila Mantilla, who's going to give her presentation on the case study. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me correctly. I'm going to ask Hayley if she can send me the slides. In the meantime, I remind everybody that in the chat, you've got the link to the presentation in English. Okay, thank you. So in the 30 minutes that we now have, I'm going to share with you a case study that is present here, building a community climate and health. As Irene mentioned, I'm a doctor and an epidemiologist and I've been working in health and the environment for more than 15 years. And I'm going to tell you a bit about my own history. It starts when I decided to apply for a master's degree in climate and society, which is uh, uh, recognized by the Institute of the Earth. And I'm going to tell you the whole process that I've been undertaking for, in a way, to contribute to the IAI in climate and health. Next, please. So the framework in which we're going to work is on this International Research Institute for Climate and Society, where I did initial practice during, in the framework of my master's degree. And I wanted to tell you that this is an institute whose aim is to improve the capacity of communities to mitigate the impact of climate change with a specific aim of improving human life and the environment, especially in developing countries. In this mission, they have four specific objectives, which is to do research when it comes to uh, impact of climate change in all sectors. The strategy to fulfill this is training at international level. And the most important of it all is that through research and training, we create application mechanisms in the different realities of the different countries in which we work with. And of course, to leave scientific evidence through publications. So in this framework, when I got to the Institute to do my practice towards the end of my master's degree, I found that they had been working on doing a diagnosis of what had been going on, of why people in the health sector were not interested in including climate information in their work. Haley, the next one, please. So in this sense, when I got to the Institute and I did this diagnosis of uh, giving the reasons why there is no uh, option to create an interface between climate and health, well, first of all, after a great process of literature review and the consensus of experts, I find three elements in that diagnosis. One of the is the gap and the conceptual knowledge of climate, climate change, data and information, methodologies and resources available to the public health community. So 
The other thing was uh, there were experts, but there was no link between them at global level. And the last thing is that there was no type of training curriculum that was standardized and that could be used to socialize so that more people could make you the material. So based on this, part of my exercise as during my practice of my master's degree was the outcomes of this, uh, which was the outcome of this master's degree. With this diagnosis, I proposed the Institute that we should create an exercise on global training that would allow people to create this interface between climate and health. Next slide, please. And in this process, we created a team because even though we might have good ideas ourselves and the diagnosis is clear, it's very difficult to work on your own. And so during this process, internally at the Institute, we had Madeleine Thompson, who was the head of the health department in this International Institute of Health and Climate. And she wanted us to materialize this idea of creating a training program that was standardized in using uh, information for global health. So she was at the origin of the project, Noyo Imbo, who Judy is an uh, odontologist, and they started with this diagnosis. After this, when I arrived, I suggest that it's necessary to partner with different people one of the possibilities was to do so within the same university with other people who would be interested in this process. And that's why we got in touch with Patrick Pini, who was at the time the head of the environmental sciences at the School of Public Health at Columbia, and with Mark Becker, who was the director of the information management of, uh, of the earth in Columbia. And with them, we started doing an exercise of if we what we wanted to create was to create a training program that included a global coverage, we needed to see how we were going to structure it. And so I'm going to share with you all the questions we asked ourselves within our team to be able to produce what we did later on. Next slide. So basically, during this a very small team, we started to ask these questions. What we wanted this course to disseminate, we wanted to work with health and climate, with public health and climate, and or adaptation or mitigation. And what was the concept that we had on health, climate, public health, and mitigation ourselves? Because uh, the reference framework existed, but whoever uh, designs a training course needs to have this. The other thing was why? Why did we want to do this? To raise awareness, to reduce impacts, to solve local climate and public health problems, or just to generate evidence or to make publications. The other thing was who? Who were the other people that we wanted to take on during this process? And this is where, during this brainstorming session, we thought that we had to include decision makers, students from undergrad and and um, graduate students, we had a great array of different stakeholders, but which we did not have accuracy on. And during the same process of knowing what, why, and who we wanted to involve during this uh, process, We also had other questions such as where we wanted to do this, whether at global, regional, local level, how, whether we wanted to do this face to face, online, blended, multi or interdisciplinary, and how we were going to do this with what resources, whether it was, was with donors, governments, academia, institutions, or a mix. And the other important thing that was also considered quite relevant was defined that any process that we did needed some kind of monitoring that meant evaluation uh, and evaluating impact. So during this whole process, we started to discuss this within our group and within each of the organizations that we were working with at the institution 
uh, Institute of uh, Research and Society and, and Climate. Um, within the School of Public Health, with the School of Epidemiology, Environmental Sciences, and Global Health, and within the network of uh, information on the earth, we did the same exercise with the people who were working therein. It's important to mention that all the people involved have different uh, backgrounds. We work with geographers, with uh, people with uh, sciences of the atmosphere, with engineers, with geographers, with uh, scientists, astrophysicists, and epidemiologists, uh, public health professionals. We also worked with students who were doing their master's degree in different areas of this uh, department. And with all of this, we spent one year doing this exercise of deciding how we were going to design this course. And now we get to the design stage after this whole process, we start with the creation of designing the course at global level. During the design, this is what we define, that any process or project needs to have clear objectives, the target population, and evaluation, evaluation, methodology evaluation, and funding financing, and a projection of how we are creating this process that feeds with and creates, um, leaves a mark during the process. And in this sense, this is what we defined. Now we're going to see these elements in more detail that we created during the design stage. So within the objectives that were identified for this course, the first one was that we wanted the participants to understand the role of climate in the burden of climate sensitivity diseases and events. The other thing was to use new tools for analyzing climate and epidemiological data. Uh, for the institute where I did my research and later on I worked, had a data library system, which is a compilation of all global information on data on climate from different sources, satellites, uh, meteorological data and even information from paleoclimate, which is that come is derived from rings from trees. And in order to consolidate this data library, and of course, at that time, we introduced um, the geographical information that was not. Uh, quite widespread in the area of health at the time. The other thing was we wanted to understand how to better improve the decision-making process using the climate information. And those were the four objectives uh, for the course. And the target population meant uh, people from meteorology, climate, and we wanted to create that interface. And when I speak of health, we usually we speak in general terms. And usually when we focus on public health, public uh, human health, animal health, we usually use the term that includes a community that uh, includes different sectors. It's not just the people working in the health sector, but also in different sectors who help so that we can have health in our community. Más grande de 25 personas porque lo que queríamos hacerlo era muy personalizado y muy tutorial. The course was to include 25 people, and also we included universities, governmental and non-governmental institutions where the professionals came from. Also, once the people started working with these processes, institutions needed to make sure that these trained people would train others in turn when going back to the workplace. Next, please. That allowed us to work with the process evolution and to change our concept so that uh, we could create other foundations. Methodology. This was an in-person four-week course. Uh, the courses were held in New York, so it was two weeks in New York. 
the course had four components, you know, first of all, the conferences in the morning and the afternoon we implemented what we had seen in the morning by uh, implementing this information system called data library. The third component, so that was a practical session. Number three, each person that was part of the process had to have an individual project. And number four, evaluation. Also, we ask each person to take their epidemiological and meteorological data for their individual projects, and they were included in the Institute's system. And this allowed us to uh, carry out some ana uh, analytical studies. We had four modules. Module one, basic concepts in public health and climate change. Number two, sources and tools for the analysis of climate public health data. Three, how we can use climate information. And four, which was very important within the process, was to create a module to allow people to understand how they must write proposals, because they found it difficult to write proposals so that then they would be able to apply for funds. So these were the four modules. The other element we had was an assessment uh process with this methodology we aimed to shed light on the process in order to have uh, uniformity when it comes to creating a climate and health community of practice next please within the assessment process we worked with the design and we had a student assessment, an organizer assessment, a teacher assessment, and a support personnel assessment. We want, When we started, we wanted to know what worked, what didn't, and what we could change over time. Because uh, we knew that our project would last at least five years. Within that process, we created many uh, documents, you know, certain daily, weekly surveys, to students and also a final assessment to all the participants, also teachers and support personnel. Next, please. So this is a, the a creation process, a design process, and then we addressed the implementation stage. It was a five year project, project, so until 2017. You will see that we're still within this process, uh, which has changed with uh, participation of other stakeholders as well. Um, it was very important to have facilitators as well. We managed to identify between 20 and 30 facilitators from different regions and of different profiles. Have a look at the profiles on the screen. We have people from meteorological and climate agencies, decision makers, university um, professionals, also people who had worked on uh, research that was uh, within a PhD framework. We also identified the funding processes. Here you can see the institutions that funded the course. The first one, the first course was funded by NOAA. And then we worked with the ministries of health, meteorological agencies, PAHO, WHO, and also universities and institutes so that they would fund the individuals that were part of the process. Sorry, there's something wrong uh, with the slide. Sorry about that, um, because there's some information missing. In this implementation process, we created several courses. It was four courses in New York, also courses per region, one in the Andean region, one in the Mercosur region. We also had local courses in Colombia, Madagascar, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Brazil, and we held global courses in Italy. Uh, through a stakeholder, a partner we found, which is the Theoretical Physics uh, Institute in Trieste, Italy. Next, please. Uh, regarding results, when we 
create this type of training strategy, it is very important to keep people informed as they have been part of the whole process. One of the process we that was important was to keep these people, uh, these group of groups of students posted as they participated in our course every year. So we did the following. We decided to have a, a newsletter in the languages that our participants spoke. We wrote a newsletter in English, French, and Spanish. Next, Haley, please. Um, these are just a, a, a few images showing the type of newsletter that we had. Basically, we had, you know, an editorial section to let them know what was going on, uh, to tell them about the courses that had been held, the projects, uh, the, the ongoing projects, and also the potential interconnection opportunities between the groups in order to uh, do collaborative work. Next one, please. We also created a website that uh, was a process where we consolidated all the information that was being produced by the groups. And we created a database, including all the publications related to the diseases that were related to climate or climate sensitive, um, in order to help this community and to, uh, to keep the evidence as updated as possible. Therefore, we created a network of information. Next, please. Results. Uh, I talked about diagnosis first, and another problem was that we didn't have a training program. So part of the results of this process is that we created the first curriculum for best practices on climate information for public health. This was created by, as you can see here, I was one of the authors and also my colleague, Lawrence, uh, who was uh, a French physician. So we developed a competency-based curriculum after seeing what was going to be happening regarding health education that was going to uh, become a skill, skills-based discipline. Here we have the people that participated in the process. It was not just the two of us. This also included all the facilitators and tutors that participated in the 2008-2010 courses. We also had the students that participated in the course. There was a review process with people that had expertise in uh, writing uh, education curricula. Here you, have, you can see the, the names on the screen. These were people from uh, health uh, and epidemiology. Next, please. This is just for reference. This is included in the literature, um, but it's just to give you an idea of this curriculum. Here we have the different domains and the competencies because the idea was to recreate the objectives we had included in the course. Well, what changed regarding domain was what had to do with information and technology, and also regarding the uh, uh, health and climate training um, section. From the very beginning, we expected participants to you know, repli uh, reproduce these activities at the workplace. Next, please. Also, other results. Here you can see the cover of a publication uh, written by the WMO and the WHO. We included every case study and other studies uh, conducted under this project. Of course, we included other cases from other universities. And this is a, an important publication that you can see uh, if you want to see what the students did as they uh, took our course. Until 2007, we had around 250 graduates and 35 facilitators that were coordinated and standardized uh, to teach the course. We had four national courses led by graduates. 
And that's really important. We also had three regional courses, one at the Southern Cone and another one at the Andean region held in Italy. We also have all the technical reports uh, developed and we have all the information systematized. We also have technical reports on the impact of each process. More results, the research projects by graduates and their publications in scientific journals. Also, the training material has been written in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. We have a network of graduates that is creating training opportunities in the countries and regions, and also graduates as managers in different international institutions. Um, also, uh, Dr. Anna Stewart, was a graduate, took this course. Also, Carlos Barbosa took this course. We have, well, the first person to coordinate the office created in climate and health at PAHO, at the WHO, took this course. And uh, much of the literature as presented by Dr. Stewart in her first talk on racial law uh was also part of this course so these people are part of this process and it's important that you to see that courses are some uh, like a living entity and they have results and this is having an impact on different areas and uh initiatives dear Hilma, sorry i know you're about to finish but i would like to remind you that you have five minutes left thank you thank you thank you Irene. okay yes i'm timing myself thank you next please Um, and this shows you the type of project uh, implemented in the Southern Cone and Andean region courses. And this is also part of what we have regarding systematization. And this is also how we have managed to obtain funding and the participation of people that work in Ministry of Health meteorological institutes and the academia, because the idea was to promote these uh, research processes and projects. Next, please. Let's now focus on the interface. You know that this implementation process was between, took place between 2008 and 2017. But around 2016, we have, you know, the creation of the GCCHE. Um, this was an initiative uh, developed by the University of Columbia. Uh, the Obama administration, you know, assigned this role to the university. The idea was to de to develop curricula that would allow the health sector to improve the installed capacity when it comes to including climate information in university uh, curricula especially regarding public health. In 2016, when this starts to happen, this training and course uh, process, our course, sorry, uh, was then shared with the GCCHE. And this is how now the GCCHE is leading this process, which, which many of you know well. And of course, you're part of this course now. And the Global uh, Consortium is one of the main partners behind this study course. Next one, please. As you know, if you want to be a member of the GCCHE, you can do so through different institutions. You can, of course, be a member through, um, through other means as well. And within this process, my university uh, became part of the global consortium. And one of the of uh, uh, elements that was defined was that all the GCCHE members needed to conduct a survey. I conducted this survey at the School of Medicine in Colombia regarding what was taught regarding climate change at university schools. The idea was to have some diagnostic information to know what the baseline was and also to help us include climate and health in uh, university curricula. Uh, for instance, in, in uh, Colombia, you have 59 universities with schools of medicine, and we didn't have curricula including climate and health issues. And we had very few projects. 
some some tutors have projects, but not as universities. Next one, please. Uh, so we conducted a survey, we published the results, and we uh, implemented a project within the university called Climate and Health Integration in the Undergraduate Medical Curriculum. Uh, we have been uh, in the process for a year and a half, and we are now including this uh, topic in the graduate courses regarding in the, at the School of Medicine. We are implementing the competencies defined at the GCCHE regarding what a curriculum should include. So as you know, the process starts out global, but then uh, it lo uh, is localized per region, per country. And then all the members that have participated in the process start working and they create their own projects. This is a curricular project, but also we have, for instance, a project in Argentina. They created an early warning system related to heat waves, and now it is including uh, health prevention plans uh, and they work together with the Ministry of Health. Next one, please. And some TD actions and challenges. First of all, this process shows the integration of different uh, fields. Also, we need to include non-academic actors, especially governmental and non-governmental institutions. Um, there's something missing on the slide, never mind. Um, also, TD action is very important. And we, we need to remember that in these courses, we we had a great communication. We needed to use a native language of the people we were working with. And that's very important. There was something else that was very important regarding TD actions. Many of the people that were part of this uh, community that was created uh, have, you know, uh, developed their own initiatives that open up their opportunities to, you know, keep on doing TD work. Next one, please. Next one, please. Thank you. Uh, challenges. We need to continue increasing coverage in the coverage in the climate and health training process. This course is trying to address this challenge. We need to strengthen the application of research project results. Uh, they shouldn't just, you know, uh, be published uh, in a high impact journal. They need to be implemented. We need to strengthen the capacity of trainees in statistical modeling skills. Or we need to create groups that uh, create this process. We need to continue to encourage publication of scientific evidence. We need to effectively communicate the results of initiatives. Um, not just in the community, because what we did was uh, show the results of the processes with decision makers in the different um, ministries of health and meteorological agencies. And we also need to strengthen the management of financial resources of governmental entities. Resources are not the issue. The issue is how to manage them. And also we need to uh, in a way, follow up the, on the process and support uh, the different projects. Yes, I think that's the end. It's the final I slide. Think, uh, this is the end of the last and slide. These are the just to provide you with references. And the next one, Haley, is just for you to know that Another great outcome that we had was the publication of this book on climate information for public health action, which compiles many of the aspects that I've been mentioning. And of course, I'm available for all questions. Men, thank you very much, Hilma. And we remind all of you that you can ask questions in the chat. The slides will be available on the website and that you will be able to find all the links that Hilma has just shared, along with all the references. So we're now going to continue with Gabriela, uh, uh, Marshalli, and Nadine Garcia. We're going to talk about ethics in uh, TD research. Uh, go ahead, please. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to start 
with we will skip the first two slides, but just to remind of the um, learning objectives for this session and the session focal points, but because of um, short time, um, these slides can review them. So um, we wanted to briefly just um, review and thank all the participants for um, the feedback that we received on the first uh, sessions. We were very happy to see the feedback, um, the commentarios, and um, to see that overall, it's been a very positive experience for everyone. And we also found the remaining um, questions that people had to be very helpful as we design the, um, the final sessions and think about uh, the types of examples to give. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to provide us uh, with this feedback. And we will continue um, to try to meet these needs um, throughout the next sessions. Okay. Um, in our last session, uh, we ran out of a bit of time for the final slides. So we're actually going to begin here, but I think it speaks nicely as well with the um, case study we just heard from Gilma and. One of the big challenges, as well as um, one of the kind of exciting parts of transdisciplinary research are the diverse data streams. Um, so with transdisciplinary research, because we are bringing together um, people from across different disciplines um, <clears throat> who might do qualitative, quantitative um, research, we get data from many sources and data in many formats. Um, and so I wanted to introduce everyone to what is uh, known as the FAIR standards, findable, accessible, interoper interoperable, and re reusable. And that's because the interoperability of data is one of the big challenges of TD science. Um, and if this challenge can be met, it also is a way to really help accelerate the pace of research to find and discover innovative solutions, um, but it takes thought and planning. And that's one of the things um, that's very important here. And so when we think about um, how to overcome this challenge of having diverse methods and data sets, um, we see how it can be very difficult to manage and integrate across um, data as well as across different knowledge systems and epistemologies, which Gabriella will speak to an example of that um, very soon. So um, the FAIR data standards were um, created and have been used um, in transdisciplinary research as well as environmental health research and global change research. And this helps because we see that we have data that's coming from quantitative sources, qualitative sources, as well as anecdotal and experiential um, data. And so what this tool helps us to do is to really begin at the research planning stage and think about the entire data life cycle. Um, and some researchers actually recommend, um, if you can, even taking a backwards planning approach, um, thinking through the types of data that you'll be um, managing and then trying to plan um, in that way. And so this covers from all phases of research planning from uh, data collection to how data will be stored, processed, analyzed, and dissem disseminated, and also asks us to really think about open um, data, which is starting to be um, a very important practice and data sharing. Um, and this can even be how metadata is, um, how you use metadata. So how your data is tagged, the types of descriptions um, that are used with the data, how you can make that data reusable for others. And that is a kind of a new area that is really growing in environmental health, public health and global environmental change as well as climate change is having other scientists be able to use and reuse um, data sets so they can be combined in new ways or synthesized in new ways. And I know this is a little blurry, we blew it up, but um, this um, gives the idea here of 
how the FAIR um, standards work across the life cycle from planning um, and also planning your metadata um, that you're gonna use, collecting and harmonizing your data, um, processing and analyzing it in transparent ways, um, describing and preserving your data, so how it will be deposited in uh, repositories, um, and then also how researchers can go in and discover um, data that uses FAIR standards in order to reuse that data. So um, this is one uh, kind of way that people are thinking about this challenge, this great challenge of the interoperability of diverse data sets from diverse um, sources. And here, um, Gabriella. Gracias, Lili. Hola a todos. Qué gusto. Thank you, Lili. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see all of you again. I hope that you had a productive session last week. And I wanted to bring quickly thank you, Lourdes and Elena, for the interpretation, and Haley and Anwar for the great work behind the scenes in organizing the sessions. So, as Lily was just saying, we're now going to share with you a tool uh, that we had been discussing on how to organize the TD work. And we wanted to give you more examples on strategies methodologies or specific tools. So now we're going to talk about TD integration strategy, which is what we learn from social learning is boundary objects. Boundary objects have to do with how a collaborative work is structured and how it promotes learning, whether are shared concepts and shared mental processes. Boundary objects have been uh, widely studied as a way to conceptualize and operationalize collective learning, especially social learning. And it has been identified taking up different forms. We've been working with a science and technology approach. And this allows us to understand common grounds or common shared experiences, which are identified through joint working strategies. And this has to be done with learning communities and that improve the success of joint work. And they facilitate the uh, crossing of uh, transdisciplinary boundaries. And as, as Eggleston was uh, described. Uh, it includes a symbolic and syntactic element from different contexts, and that means finding common ground. And this is what we're going to see now. The next one, Lily. I was just uh, remembering the slide from uh, Dr. Mantilla where she described the uh, creation of the project she undertook and we have we had three questions on she had questions on who why and what was going to be done and in the next two slides we're going to see how that TD works the example that we have here is uh, a boundary object it's a project we're currently working with along with Lillian Marshall this project tries to examine the integration of uh, traditional or local knowledge in the evaluation of uh, different ecosystems in the Americas. We have three different countries, and the protocol that I'm going to describe is uh, within these three countries. We follow a presentation per country case presentation with all the team. In Colombia, this was done in 2020, just right before the pandemic. We got together, we asked people who were working in the three cases, and I'm speaking of researchers and participants from the different affected communities. And they did a case presentation, with, of course, in the framework uh, with a time lapse of two days to work and prepare. In the second task that was undertaken, once the case presentations were identified, we identified three or five 
keywords per case that would reflect the process that people would see in our case, in the case of governance in their countries. And once we had that information, we did a social network analysis of keywords with a software. And as you can see, well, it's not that clear perhaps, but this is a, a wide array of different elements described as uh, being relevant to each case. And there were three different terms or concepts that coincided and that were mentioned as important themes to be considered in all three cases. So these three terms, next slide, Lily, please. These three terms that we identified, which is what we call the a boundary object, were conflict, power asymmetries, and plurality. So once we've identified these three concepts, we had the task of having two sessions where we described what, uh, for all of us, these, each of these concepts meant, how we saw them and how we identified them in the cases we were studying. So we did an exercise of what we called sharing uh, reference framework, uh, frames of reference. And speaking of these uh, in these terms helps you to create a common language. And that's why it's easier, and it has during the development of this project, to discuss these concepts and so this terminology also defines or shapes the rest of how of the project development so this helps in the literature review for all three cases in that american literature review how this is used and what they refer to and how they have an impact on the three cases that we were studying next slide English is on the screen um, or in Espanol, aquí en la votación. And the poll is in Spanish. You have two minutes. Okay, um, Haley, is it possible to show the results? Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so I see the um, aquí con, uh, sixty percent uh, establishing um, a common kind of finding common grounds or establishing this kind of common uh, conceptual space in our work and also managing and integrating diverse data sets as well as developing shared methodologies. And I know that was a question that came up in the feedback as well of um, especially questions such as how do you balance the breadth and depth in transdisciplinary research because the integration of many different actors means that probably have more breadth in these projects, but you still want to maintain um, rigor and depth um, and maintaining rigor in methodology also uh, was a question. So we were keeping that um, in mind and we'll integrate uh, some of this into um, next into our next session. Um, what we're going to do now is um, actually show a, a video, it will look more clear, um, but let me check that I'm sharing with sound really quickly. Um, okay. Okay. So um, this is uh, Dr. Martin Garcia Cartagena. He's speaking in Spanish. So if you need the, the translation, please, uh, to English, please use that. And um, 
El gobierno regional de forma participativa asociado a medidas para eh, incrementar la resiliencia. Bien, eh, creo que un buen lugar para... Oh, I think a good place to start today's with today's lesson would be to define what public policy is. There are different ways to define public policy from a reductionist per, uh, perspective. Public policy tends to be defined uh, related to legal demonstrations from government authorities, for instance, developing legal framework or the development of laws, decrees, uh, rules, regulations, and other um, manifestations of public governance. But from a broader perspective and from a more technical approach from a Western public policy, public policy can be understood as any activity that is resulted from government uh, practices. But also government inaction can be considered as a form of public policy associated to all levels of public governance, whether that's central, regional, local, depending on the type of governance that each country has. And this uh, last point has to do with the different social uh, or cultural problems that because of their political risk that is associated, tend to be marginalized from the public agenda intentionally because acknowledging these problems in the political discourse also means acknowledging the responsibility of authorities to face and provide solutions to these problems. That's why ignoring and silencing these problems in the public discourse from uh, public authorities, that means public in, in act in inactivity can also be a form of public policy. But beyond these definitions, there are some characteristics that from a technical point of view can help us to uh, set the boundaries of what can be considered as a public policy. Let's now go on to the next slide so we can discuss this in more depth. Well, as I was saying in the previous slide, one more technical a more technical and wider definition of public policy would allow us to define it as any action or inaction that results from a central uh, government level or with any other level of decentralized government system. But apart from this definition, public sciences tells us that there are different characteristics which define what public policy is and isn't. For instance, for a public policy to be considered as such, it needs to, first of all, involve a, a public authorities, that is the government or any other public actors with the administration of a state from a legislative, judicial and executive powers. Also, public policy involves decisions to willingly or unwillingly act or not to act within a in public interest policy. At another instance, public policy is a result of a complex interaction process between stakeholders and politicians. But beyond uh, going beyond the result, public policy is also uh, the process itself that leads to these decisions. Public policies to be considered such, they need to include the in, uh, commitment or investment of public resources. And the term resources is understood here from a broad perspective. Uh, when we talk about human, legal, cultural infrastructure resources, and also, uh, of course, financial resources. Finally, public policies tend to be normative. This means that public policy to be such, to be so, need to be adapted to the behavior of market entities and also to public agencies. And they also need to regulate or normalize the behavior of private um, members. After having defined our, you know, sphere when we talk about uh, public policy, now we're going to address the, the public policy making process. 
within this process, we find that TD is essential. And in case you have forgotten, after so many uh, words about what public uh, public policy is or is not, we need to remember that uh, public policy is any action or inaction that evolves from uh, the centralized government system or from any government uh, level in a decentralized system. But now let's ask ourselves, how does a, is a public policy uh, made? Now we have to cite several models, but first of all, let us focus on the standardized model used in uh, English speaking countries and that has been implemented in Latin America to varying degrees of success. This is what is called the rational uh, uh, model of public policy making. What is this about? This is a model that aims to simplify, classify, sequence, systematize, or as Foucault would say, in a different context, discipline the public policy making process. The different stages, including in the rational model, tend to follow cycles. First of all, identification and prioritization of topics of interest to the public agenda, also analyzing uh, issues, and finally implementing and evaluating the results of the implementation. This very briefly summarizes the rational model of public policy making from a rational perspective. One of the key elements of the rational model that we are addressing is the use of scientific information to inform and justify um, state decisions objectively. And we need to, you know, focus on this again. And I'm saying that we need to uh, stop and think because we need to think about the interaction between science and politics in the public policy making process. From the rational model, the way in which science informs the policy is through the analysis of public policies and also from a positivist perspective. Why? Because rational uh, models of um, public policy analysis and informed decision making tend to be objective about all this. Sorry, just a minute. This is easy when there are easy problems, but what happens when we need to address complex problems? Before we go on, I'd like to talk about the difference between uh, an easy problem and, or a complex problem, or as Ritalan Weber says, weak problem, wicked problem. So it's simple, simple problems versus wicked problems. Uh, the, defining these problems is very important in public policy making. So we need to think about the contrast between simple and wicked problems because this definition will tell us what kind of analysis we should implement in order to inform policy making. According to a classical publication by Rachel and Weber, an easy, a simple problem comes from an easy variable system where these relations are linear, predictable, where the system's limits are easily found. There are no ambiguities, no conflicts of interest, Therefore, it is easy to identify the problem and also uh, the solution. For instance, think about a process uh, to, for instance, uh, determine to decide on the garbage collection routes uh, at a given, uh, I don't know, local government. In some cities in Latin America, garbage collection can be a huge issue. Um, but let's say that in principle, you know, deciding on these routes should be a linear and easy problem. In this case, the rational approach is useful if the problem is simple. It's useful and valuable. But the ra rational model is no longer valid when we need to address complex problems. Uh, characterized by nonlinear variables, where the limits uh, of the system uh, uh, expand, they're hard to determine, there is ambiguity and conflict of interest. And this hinders the uh, 
the potential solutions. Some clear examples of wicked problems. These are climate related problems. For instance, displacement and relocalization of communities exposed to rising water uh, levels and also uh, people vulnerable to floods. And this is a, a case I would like to go back to at the end of this presentation. And as Fontowitz and Ravitz would say, we have um, high uncertainty regarding decisions. A positivist and applied science uh, based on hegemonic and rational models when it comes to analyzing public policies um, are no longer valid. And within these decisions, we need a different uh, knowledge creation model. Fantowitz and Ravitz call this post-normal science. This concept has evolved into different research lines, for instance, participatory research action, uh, community-based research, citizen uh, science, etc. And the TD model that we are addressing in this course. Why? Because these knowledge creation models acknowledge the fact that in, a con in an uncertain context, trying to find solutions has more to do with articulating and facilitating uh, the conversation between uh, the stakeholders that participate in the problem in order to distribute responsibilities so that we can address the wicked problem. To do this, we can also resort to uh, narratives from political science because there are other models that create public policy-making processes that do not necessarily um, respond to the uh, logical, the rational, uh, the rational criteria we described before. And they're more similar to the TD uh, model. For instance, the political game model, the discursive model, the garbage can model, which is the, the name of an actual model implemented and the institutional model as well. Let's see how each of these uh, models describes the public policy making process and uh, what is the role of the analyst, of the analyst uh, analysis and uh, the uh, interaction between science and politics. Let us have a look at the first, at the political game. This model does not consider the public policy making process as a number of stages that need to, you know, occur. This model considers the public policy making process as a political and strategic process that includes tensions between uh, specific powers and interests that are um, that have a major role in the political arena it marginalizes other more vulnerable groups from the public policy making process generally in this process the ro role of analysts and of uh, the analysis is to use technical tools in order to include these marginalized voices into the public policy making process then we have policy making as a discourse this is a more naive process policy making is a so a collective social learning process which includes several voices and coalitions that reflect different different systems of values and knowledge. In this case, the, the analysis tools work within the discourse analysis and communication arena because uh, the mission of the uh, of public policy analysis is to overcome differences and uh, value differences as well through uh, negotiation and conflict resolution tools. In this case, positivism um, is no longer valid, let's say, because they include other scientific models that articulate several knowledges and wisdoms that represent, represent a major pillars of TV science. Third, we have policymaking as a garbage can. Uh, so yes, garbage can, that's the name. This uh, describes a chaotic process that is illogical. Uh, problems, solutions, our participants come and go in a dynamic, uh, random, fragmentary, and reticulated way. 
public policies are a result of involuntary um, connections between discourses, practices, and solutions called windows of opportunity. In this model, the analysis and analysts do not try to find solutions from positivist science. Rather, they want to create the uh, positive conditions of interaction so that political stakeholders interact in order to create this window of, of opportunity where stakeholders and problems can converge. Finally, policymaking as an institutional process. This suggests that public policymaking processes are the result of more complex interactions uh, among normative, regulatory, political, and other types of systems that tend to institutionalize the marginalization of vulnerable popular sectors away, and to keep them away from public policymaking processes. In this model, the role of the analyst and of the analysis is to challenge this marginalization that has become institutionalized by implementing innovative approaches that can mediate and facilitate uh, when it comes to work with, it, with several political sectors, scientific policies, and local and indigenous uh, knowledge and wisdom. So my main point is that although the rational and systematic processes of public policy making are useful when it comes to addressing simple problems, when we deal with complex problems such as um, human health issues, we need to implement models that will enable us to articulate the role of uh, social and political and economic stakeholders because they might be opposed. So uh, this complexity needs to be uh, addressed in a productive and fair way um, for all the stakeholders involved. In other words, science needs to understand that public policy making processes in complex situations are not rational scientific uh, problems. And science needs to understand this. Otherwise, we'll have problems in the interface between science and policy making. We need to understand that public policy making processes are really complex. Historically, these processes tend to exclude and marginalize certain social sectors. And we need to remember that TD participation may provide uh, an opportunity to articulate several value, uh, values and knowledge systems through an in the innovative analysis of public policies. And this would facilitate the democratization of public policy making. We are going to uh, stop there for the sake of time. Uh, next week, we'll have a number of grounded um, examples, including one um, from Martin uh, and some of his work, um, and additional from uh, Jawick and Marshallese work in Jamaica. Oh, for the sake, oops. For the sake of time, uh, we're going to end on um, a second Zoom poll and then we'll move into question and answer. Again, you can see the English on the screen or um, the Spanish is in the vocación. Okay, um, Haley, perhaps show the results and then we'll transition uh, for the final 15 minutes so there's time for the Q&A. Thank you. Wow, okay, so interesting. Um, so we see here actually that um, the response with the great majority is democratizing uh, the process um, making the process, uh, the democratizing the policy making process and building capacity for broader engagement. So, um, and then the next one is uh, serving as a mediator between diverse uh, groups or, or multiple sectors in society. 
So um, these polls, uh, I hope, are interesting uh, to take, but also provide a lot of really good feedback um, to our group as well. So at this point, we have 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to end the, sh the screen sharing and emphasize. All right. Irene. Uh, gracias, Lily. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Martin, for his presentation as well. I was trying to take a snapshot of the survey to share it on our social media. Yes. Uh, can you please ask questions in the chat? Uh, as we had said, have said before, they won't all be answered live. We have around 12 minutes to answer your questions. Lily, now, sorry, Hilma. Uh, Hilma, there are many questions addressed to Hilma. Uh, the first one. And this is Nivardo Rodriguez. Hilma, can you please say if there is some sort of TD research using uh, environmental history data? Thank you for the question. Um, I do have some examples that might be useful when it comes to environmental history. They are related, for instance, to using uh, paleoclimate information um, by using information from carbon isotopes when we analyze tree rings. And based on that, you can, you know, find out what happened at a given area. Um, I don't know, uh, in regarding uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, for instance, and how that affected the, the life in some specific areas. This is done at the Institute of the Earth, uh, University of Columbia, Columbia. There is a specific lab that focuses on that type of project. They are now working with a project that has to do with this that process, but in the Andean region. And so I think that the person asking the question is someone from Bolivia. I have answered in the chat. Maybe we can, I don't know, uh, uh, connect you with the, this project and they can uh, tell you a bit more about the process. Right now, they want to, uh, you know, uh, see or find out if the communities are affected by all this, the communities living in that area. Thank you, Hilma. Uh, Lily and Gabriela, a question for you. Uh, is, uh, is there a right answer to the last survey? Is one of the answers the correct one? Or in your opinion, are there answers that are more important than others, let's say? Gabriela, would you like to go first? All answers are critical. Oh, pardon. Yo creo que todas las, las I think that all the answers are important. And I think they, they can also be prioritized depending on the project stage uh, within your process. That's my answer. Maybe Lily would like to say something else. Or Marshall Lee. Thank you, Gabi. Sonia. ¿Cómo lograron que las facultades acepten una reforma curricular para incorporar estos temas? Porque no, no suele ser sencilla esta decisión. ¿Fue asignatura por asignatura o cambiaron? ¿Cómo incluyeron todo esto en la universidad universitaria? Y también están también preguntando si esto fue un enfoque participativo. Well, I think that in the life of projects, in the case of our department, it has a curriculum plan based on competencies that allowed there to be a liaison between the reference framework that was used in the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, which I am part of, and the university is a part of as a consortium member. So this is a first element to have a term that would link the process together. The second element included that during the process, I worked in a department of preventive medicine. And when I got to the university, 
I started proposing in the semester I was coordinating to include some topics on health and climate because I was in charge of the subject vulnerability and health and to include what it, vulnerability meant in the context of climate change. So there was a specific experience in a module in one semester. The other element was that when we started to do the whole process of connecting this with the new board of the consortium where Cecilia came in, we were trying to see how we could have a direct link between the directors of the universities. And I think one of my, my university was one of the first ones to have direct contact between the dean, the head of the degree of medicine in for undergraduate degrees. And we started to create that link through a seminar. During that seminar, we gathered all coordinators from the different subjects, from the curriculum and the plan that we had at the university, and we included the director of the degree, the dean, and we showed the importance of incorporating this subject through a seminar. After that, we had the opportunity during to have a meeting with the dean and the director coordinator that I proposed why to initiate the including this subject. So these are several steps. As you can see, this took six months. This did not take place overnight. We have to show, we have uh, to show the different options. And we were able to form a work group, which was made up of professors by students and members of the uh, School of uh, Medicine, which I had class with in fourth year. And we started with this practical exercise of redesigning the uh, curriculum by semester and by modules. And at that time, we were already in the process of agreeing with each uh, assignment coordinator on how to incorporate this topic within each semester. So our goal was for next year that we could start with the first four semesters to implement what we had agreed with them. Thank you, Hilma. There is also an interest to interact with you to uh, keep in touch in order to collaborate with uh, science. Perhaps you could also share your email address with the participants. There's also a question from the for the TV group, but it would take too long to answer. So we're going to refer the question to them with who you worked with, how they were selected, which countries were involved. I think that you can share this in the upcoming session because it would take a bit longer for them to answer right now. I'm actually answering the chat, Irene. Okay, great. So we're going to add this question with in the email that we're going to send to the participants. Maria Patricia also has a question to Hilma. Which tools did you apply during the monitoring of the impacts of institutions and participants? And do you have a systematization of the results and statistics? Yes, in order to monitor and do a follow up of all the people who participated, we had very simple surveys being conducted. There were perhaps three or four questions to each of the participants so that we could observe uh, three, six uh, months and 12 months from doing the course in the process of where they were and what kind of initiatives they had. That was in terms of the uh, a year after. After that, we had an internal group within this frame, this network, which was made up of graduate students themselves. And we did a monitoring of all the papers that graduates have published and we uh, make them available. Specific statistics that I might have include from each of the courses and the impact they had on a yearly basis. And this is a part of the results that I mentioned in the technical uh, report. And this whole process has been consolidated. We have formats for surveys that if anyone needs them, everything is available online and you can access the technical aspects of the report or the content of the course of the uh, responder course for the Americas. You can find it available in French for Madagascar as well. Thank you so much, Hilma. We have a final question that has been highlighted. As I said, the other questions will be addressed by email or Gabriela and Lili will uh, be in charge with answering, of answering these questions along with Marshall in the next session. Bertalus wants 
to know whether you can mention some of the uh, challenges of the contribution to social sciences, such as uh, sociology. Yes, I think that the contribution is enormous. I think that we had the opportunity of having facilitators and students as sociologists and anthropologists. And what they provided was very important feedback so that we could adjust the curriculum. Our program had in the health sector a more epidemiological perspective, but not as much from a vulnerability perspective. So it provided in that framework to address mitigating risks on placing emphasis not only on climate threats, but also on vulnerability, which, as you know, climate risk is based on threats and vulnerability. So it was very helpful to see how qualitative methods that social sciences use facilitate finding specifically with the communities that we work with, what is their perception and what instrumentalization is needed so that any strategy that we want to apply can be legitimate and can be actually carried out. So it's very important, the role of social sciences and medicine in itself, of course, well, sometimes people overlook this, but it's a social science as well. People think it's not, but we are considered to be almost unreachable, but of course, we are a social science as well. And public health is a social science as well. Kilma, uh, I, I mentioned once again how interesting this is. There are many questions in the chat and in the list of questions. All the resources will be translated into Spanish. We're having a parallel courses. Uh, there, we're having questions whether this can be also done in Bolivia. The next week, because we're now concluding and we all know that you're all very busy, apologies for the next session, not next week, we're going to be with Lili Gabriela, and there will be a case study with Stella Hartinger, and we'll have an advice to. I, I said next session, correct? For the upcoming session, we're going to have Marcelo Rinesi, who will be speaking to us about sharing stories through data. Marcelo Rinesi is a presenter has done TED Talks, is a very interesting person, and I invite all of you to get together on Thursday with us. Thank you all so much for joining today. Thank you to the participants who prepared their presentations and also to Martin for sharing the presentation with us. We'll see you all this Thursday, uh, this week at the same time. Thank you all.